Ladies and gentlemen, let's talk about Intel's Royal Core project. It has the potential to be one of the biggest fundamental shifts in x86 processor design that I've seen in, well, let's just say a long time. Now, of course, there are many different ways that we can compare one processor versus another processor. The core count, the clock frequency, IPC, and the fun of actually figuring out how we're comparing IPC against one processor versus another. But benchmarks ultimately are the deciding factor. You run a bunch of tests on different software, and that gives you an answer of how fast one CPU is versus another. But when it comes to processor design, every so often there is a massive change in the philosophy of a company and this could be what we're going to be seeing with intel's royal core project and we're going to get into all of this after this message from the video's sponsor if you're running a copy of windows 10 which isn't activated of course not only do you have to worry about the missing customization options but there's also that annoying windows desktop watermark reminding you to activate today's video is sponsored by whokeys.com and they have an excellent price on windows 10 professional as well as home keys yeah, and they also, of course, sell games. I've bought a few Windows 10 keys with my own personal account to test everything was legit and worked in preparation for this sponsored video. You can pick up one of their keys for 25% off using the coupon code RGT in the checkout. There's links to their website in the video description. Also, if you're building a few systems, there's bundles available too. Again, you can check out whokeys.com and use the coupon code RGT for 25% off the listed Windows 10 key prices. Now, I am super excited about Royal Core for numerous reasons which will become abundantly clear as we're talking about the information. However, I want to say that I could not double source some of this info. And we are talking about a project which is most likely not going to really see the light of day until let's say 2025, 2026. We'll get into specifics in a moment. Because of that, I want you to take this as a speculative leak. I'm much more confident talking about, let's say, Zen 5 information because it's not that far into the future. But with something like Royal Core, well, it is quite far into the future. So not only could we see aspects of this change or get, well, cancelled, well, the information that I've been sent could also be incorrect. With that said, I am super interested to see what Intel are cooking up here because if it is true, there are a huge number of benefits of Royal Core. Now, with that said, let's start talking about it, shall we? Speaking very generally for a moment and ignoring specific use cases, Intel have been embracing both energy efficient and performance designs for a while now. For example, the 13900K here sports eight wrapped light high performance cores and 16 energy efficient cores augment this too. With their current designs, Intel can raise or lower the ratio of E slash P cores, which also provides market segmentation and of course for other reasons such as power consumption and efficiency for example in mobile. AMD will also be leveraging energy efficient cores too and one of the ways they're doing this with x86 anyway is to leverage C cores. I've spoken about them numerous times in the channel previously so I won't go into depth here but they're very similar in principle to let's say Zen 4 but C cuts and snips things to reduce power consumption and die size as needed. Okay, so how the hell does Royal Core actually work, and why is it such a big step versus the current Intel design? Further, why am I calling it a project rather than an architecture? Well, in a nutshell, there's no separate core types anymore. Instead, there's a single CPU core type, well actually it's a tile, we'll get more into that in a moment, which essentially can function as either a performance core or a multiple E cores. Now, a very simplified way to think of this is it's somewhat like two NVIDIA cards coming together in SLI to work on a problem, where two cards are separate cores that ignore other things, such as VRAM, PCBs, and anything else on a graphics card, and just think of the raw chip in your mind. And this can work on rendering a game in SLI, but you can also disable SLI and have two cards which can work on two different things. For example, virtual machines. Now, of course, Royal Core is very different to this than a pair of GPUs in SLI, but I wanted to give you at least a little bit of a reference point before we dive deeper. And why am I calling it a project? Well, because it isn't a specific CPU architecture or processor name, such as, say, Skylake or Gracemont. Instead, Royal Core is more of an internal name for the brand new project itself and how Intel will go forward designing its next generation of processors. A very simple way to think of this again, and again, not 100% accurate, for 
not least of which because one is internal, one is in public, is NVIDIA, of course, brands its recent graphics cards as RTX versus Pascal and earlier, which was GTX. That's because RTX has features like hardware-based RT. So the whole idea behind Royal Core is that it's basically a fusion to improve performance and efficiency, but at a smaller area cost. So as it can work by grabbing a CPU or the tile, if you want, it can dynamically adjust how it functions, operating in, say, Cove mode, fusing together if there's attacks in task, or if there's a bunch of light work, it can essentially act as an e-core, mont mode. From what I was told, this should mean that there's a super wide issue core no longer being a prerequisite. Instead, this is a more elegant design, assuming any of this actually works. Now, there are a number of challenges here. Caches, data coherency, bandwidth for just a few of the more obvious ones. I have been told a few things, like there is a distributed op cache, which the CPU cores can share, with pipelines uh, fusing together as necessary, again, based on the workload. Imagine, for example, a 16-core processor. These cores could fuse together to create, say, only eight cores. Now, I've heard mixed information of how many um, cores are basically in a tile and how many of those can stitch together. I've heard both two and four. This is potentially due to the generation of royal core or simply mixed up information. But to recap, a tile can basically act in two modes. Mont mode, which is like the E cores of now, or Cove mode, which is like the performance cores of now. So in Mont mode, each tile basically operates as two Mont cores, and in Cove mode, the tile acts as a single Cove core. So in summary of everything I've heard, uh, other than what I've just mentioned, there's a huge IPC gain. I haven't been given specific numbers. Huge performance per watt gains versus the current architecture. Traditional E slash P cores disappear, replaced by a tile, which is capable of operating in different modes. This is not a virtual core fusion, it's a physical one on the chip itself. SMT is potentially available. I've heard mixed things about this. I've heard they're testing it, but it's not a certainty right now. And the management of all of this is held, of course, on the CPU. This is not operating system dependent. In some ways, you could also say that this is like the bulldozer technology from AMD. Hopefully it's more, well, effective. But it's kind of like saying, well, in an alternative reality, if AMD had continued to refine, enhance, and perfect this technology, maybe we would have seen similar from them. Bulldozer had, well, a lot of issues. But if I was told... Um, the correct information regarding Intel's implementation, it could be a real game changer for the company. Again, it's all going to be down to the execution. As for the release date of this project and what's happening around that, well, it's not anytime soon, unfortunately. Um, Intel is, of course, working on several CPU projects at a time, as AMD does, and we are going to be seeing a number of different cores and product releases before this project comes to fruition. So, for example, Meteor Lake, Arrow Lake, and Lunar Lake. I've heard 2025 is the earliest we can expect anything, more probably a year or two out from that. Intel have just, well, let's just say that there's been a lot of delays anyway from Intel's products, so... Your guess is as good as mine whether this actually gets delayed any further. Technically speaking, though, because tiles operate in a specific ways, I was also told that Cove and Mont names can still exist. Now, I've also been told that Panther is likely one of the first architectures which leverage Royal Cove, but I don't know whether it's the first or whether there's a predecessor. I also want to add just a little bit of extra spice. Um, to my personal understanding, Jim Keller did not have much of an input on this project. Keller's main focus at Intel, to my understanding anyway, was essentially to crack down not only on Intel's process and tools for hardware bring up or CPU bring up, but also vetting the process with engineers. I'd actually heard this actually during the Intel Odyssey event I attended because Jim Keller was there at the time. He and I actually spoke very briefly, although not about this. I want to stress he didn't leak anything. Instead, we were actually talking about powerlifting, which was kind of fun. Um, but yeah, 
uh, a couple of other people did tell me that uh, that's what his job was at Intel, but this was under the table, and not from Keller directly, so obviously it's second-hand information. However, I have heard this from other sources after that, but obviously I did not have a spy camera on his desk, so I do not know his distribution of work. It's possible he oversaw some aspects of the project, or at least perhaps greenlit some of it. I do know from someone else that he had been kind of vocal on uh, some of Intel's strategies going forward, so who knows. I also want to mention that as far as my understanding goes, and this is somewhat off topic, Raptor Lake Refresh, which is due for desktop launch, of course, doesn't really change things up too much. Essentially, it's a refresh, hence the name, but it does very little other than just to adjust, let's say, the clock frequency and power consumption. The raw specifications, for example, the cache, it doesn't seem to have adjusted. Technically speaking, you could kind of say that the specs have changed somewhat because some of the SKUs may increase core count. This is potentially only E cores, but this is affecting the mid range only. And to my understanding, the higher end SKUs, for example, the 13900K, won't change for whatever the refresh is, let's say the 14900K. It's also an obvious thing to say, but what about AMD? Well, I've spoken a lot about Zen 5 over the last several months, and I don't want to repeat this information again because the video is already getting kind of long and I'll try to remember to link a Zen 5 video in the description. If not, you can just search for it on the channel. But basically speaking, Zen 5 is just a wider, higher IPC version of Zen 4. Vastly simplified, of course. Zen 6, though, allegedly is a much bigger departure in design with some significant changes. I just don't have enough information, though, other than a few murmurs to go really any deeper than that. I'm going to leave it there. Anyway, I just wanted to end the video by saying, woohoo, 100,000 subscribers. This is my, like, 100,000 subscriber dance. Um, but yeah, it's absolutely bizarre to have 100,000 subscribers listening to my waffling. And um, I can't really say much about this because, I don't know, like, it's just bizarro land. I don't know. Like, I never started out doing YouTube to be successful at YouTube. And I don't really call 100,000 subscribers, like, big or anything like that. Um, it's just very strange to have, like, I don't know, even one person that listens to me, so it's just very humbling, very, very, I don't know, very weird. Um, and there are a lot of cool things that I have done, uh, with this, and it's not just like, oh, I get to test out hardware, but there have been a lot of people I've got to interview, people you know, regular viewers that I've met just walking around and it's always really fun and really cool um, to like meet someone in the wild and be like, hey, you're the dude from YouTube. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just, uh, yeah. I, I, I mean, the main reason I do this, to be honest, is because, um, how do I say this? It's, I've gone completely and utterly off script here. In fact, I didn't actually script this bit at all. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I'm one of those individuals who I just like talking about, like, geeky crap to friends, and I don't have a huge number of people um, in my friend group anyway, like, my close friend group, who are really into, like, PC hardware and stuff. Like, I have a crap ton of people who are into video games, um, which is great, and lots of people who are into, like, movies, you know, Marvel comics, all that stuff. But when it comes to, like, talking about the megahertz and the, and the caches and all that stuff, I don't really have that many people that I was able to converse with, and it's like, you know what it's like when you're, like, really excited about something, like, oh, shit, I don't have anyone to talk to this about, <laughs> that's kind of sucky, um, you know, it's like that feeling when you're watching a new TV show, and no one else is watching it, and that's kind of one of the big reasons I started to do this, and, uh, you know, there were some other reasons as well, um, and I kind of never really expected it to be well, this. I'm not gonna lie. So, yeah, I, um, I'm not being very, uh, good with words here. I'm kind of sucking balls. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't really know what to say. It's just, it's just very weird. All I can say is I'm super grateful to everyone who has subscribed and watched the content. And uh, even if you're just someone who watches, hopefully, you know, I've uh, entertained you or bought you a smile. That's that's 
that's all I can ask for. Like, you know, just seriously. I, it's not like I've been recognized a hundred thousand times outside or anything like that. I, I haven't. I've been, you know, very fortunate, very humble just to be noticed a couple of times, you know, here and there. And I've got to meet some people as well. I've done, you know, I wouldn't even say viewer meetups because um, I think a lot of people know that uh, it wasn't like a secret. I was dating in the US for quite a while. I was um, dating in Seattle and um, there's a couple of times where I actually did like meetups with people. And, which really freaked out my girlfriend at the time. She was like, you're just going to meet some random stranger on the internet. Like, I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah. Uh, and it was really cool to like meet up with people. And those individuals, those people, I'm not going to mention, um, you know, names. It's not that they're famous or anything. I just don't want to say names of people because they haven't given me permission to. Um, and, you know, those people have become really good friends of mine and it actually kind of makes me sad because I don't get to see them that often because well they're not even in the same time zone as me um and it's just really fun and uh yeah so again I all I can say is I'm really grateful to have met people for you guys to interact comment talk to me on twitter drop emails it's just very I don't know just humbling and that's it Anyway, I'm gonna let you go. I'm gonna. Wow, I can't speak suddenly. I'm gonna let you guys go. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.